Lord, as we wait for the birth of your son, Jesus, we gather with great anticipation with all who long for your presence. We ask that your life-giving spirit may renew in us the hope of our salvation, the peace that passes all understanding, and the joy that knows no limits. Fill us today with the faith to follow your ways and to trust in your divine plan for all humanity. Come and make yourself known to us as we contemplate the miracle of the manger. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome, friends, and thank you so much for joining us as we worship together in this online way. Um, I wanted to ask a question as we begin our service today, and that is to ask you, have you ever created the perfect plan for something, an event, a birthday celebration, or whatever it is, and then watched how that perfect plan unfolds 100% successfully. And, and maybe there are a few of us who can actually claim that kind of credit today, but certainly in my experience, yes, I've planned for events and celebrations, but inevitably there's something that goes wrong. As you get closer and closer to the day, there are gremlins that creep in, um, and slowly but surely you begin to see that um, the plan doesn't work out as you initially had hoped. Neil Young once said that the devil fools with the best laid plans. And then Robert Burns in his poem says, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. And so today as we come to contemplate um, a passage from Matthew's Gospel in the season of Advent, we, we're going to look a little bit at Joseph, who I'm sure at one particular point in his life may have thought that all of his plans were laid out perfectly. Um, he was going to get married, probably have some children, uh, continue in his business, and then maybe one day retire and spend time with his children and his grandchildren. And that was his kind of big long-term plan. But as we know from the story and as we'll encounter again, something com goes completely wrong for him and he's tempted to change and to create his own plan. But we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Just a little bit of background so we understand that in, in the time and the culture when Joseph and Mary were, were born, they would have been matched together as children. Um, their families would have allowed them to become engaged as young children. And then later on, when they were probably in their teenage years, they would have gone through what was known as a, um, a, a betrothal, to be betrothed to one another. It's almost like our modern day engagement, but this was the second part in this process. And then a year later after this betrothal, there would be this marriage ceremony. Now, when we read in the, in the gospel narratives about Joseph finding out that Mary is pregnant through the Holy Spirit, we believe it's between these two occasions, between the betrothal and the marriage. And so, as I'm, as we, as I'm saying, we're going to read this now from Matthew chapter 1, so you can follow along and, uh, and see. But I want us to try and get into the heart and mind of Joseph as he sees these events unraveling before him. The best plans that he's got are now going to be completely turned up on their head. So once we've read it, I'll share a little bit and some thoughts around today's passage. So let's hear Matthew chapter 1 from verse 18 to verse 25. Today's reading is taken from Matthew 1 verses 18 to 25 and it's about the birth of Jesus. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and was unwilling to disgrace her publicly, he resolved to divorce her quietly. But after he had pondered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to embrace Mary as your wife, for the one conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, 
because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and embraced Mary as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the end of our reading from Matthew. Let's just focus on verse 19 for a moment, which says that because Joseph, Mary's husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And what we see, I believe, in that one verse is many nights of, uh, of, of wrestling, sleepless nights, worrying, anxiety, trying to figure out what he needs to do. Last week in, in church, uh, we had our children sharing in the nativity uh, story with us. That's why I'm sitting on this bench, because they were here um, on, the, on the stage. But, but one of the things that really struck me was the young lad who was playing Joseph in, uh, in the story. He was really brilliant, because when he came onto the stage, he, he showed the true extent of, of the restlessness and the anxiety of Joseph. And this young guy was wandering around the stage, going like this, holding his head. And one could really picture poor old Joseph thinking to himself, what am I going to do now? Uh, this woman that I'm betrothed to marry, um, that was the plan for my life. Now I find out that she's pregnant uh, and he faced this massive dilemma. And I don't know whether you've ever had a huge decision to make in your own life. Um, and, and you can relate to that anxiety, that toing and froing between should it be this or should it be that? Uh, maybe we don't hold our heads in our hands, but it's, it's almost like our brain is exploding because there are so many things to think about. And, and Joseph is in that place. He's, he's trying to figure out what is his next move going to be. Now, if we understand a little bit around um, the Jewish law, and because Joseph was a righteous person, he knew that publicly he would need to expose Mary in some way or to, to publicly tell people that she was pregnant. But we also know that, that he was a compassionate guy. And you can read between the lines here that he didn't want Mary to be disgraced or shamed because of this. And so he was wrestling with these two extreme things. One, should he follow the law and tell people about Mary? Or on the other hand, if he does that, she will be disgraced. And in the context, she may even have been stoned for adultery. And so this decision is not a, a simple decision. It's deeply profound. Um, and as I've said before, sometimes in our own lives, we have to make these decisions. We, we pray, Lord, show us the way. And we don't always get visitations from angels, but we get placed in the, into a situation where eventually we have to decide. And Joseph comes to this place. His, his decision, we read in verse 19, is that he's come to the conclusion that he feels he needs to quietly divorce her. That is his solution. But we see that God has a different plan because God's plan all along, it seems to be that Joseph would be the father of Jesus, to be the one who would take care of him in an earthly way. And so we, we see now, and we'll go to the next, next verse now, is, is how this impacts upon Joseph's life. But I want us just to get, before we even move on any further, just to get into that, that angst, that anxiety of this poor man as he has to wrestle with his plans being completely turned upside down. Let's move on to the next part, and then we'll, we'll share a little, a little bit around verse 20. I was sharing last week with our men's ministry about um, a, a time in my life where I'd put my name forward for the ministry, but I was going through this, this toing and froing between have I made the right decision or not, and I remember getting to a point um, in my life where, where I actually withdrew my name for a time, where I thought, no, 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 I don't, don't want to go ahead with this. Um, and, then, and then through a whole lot of God incidents, 
Um, I was fortunate that my name was actually able to be carried forward and I went into the ordained ministry that way. But it's that that came to mind when I was thinking about poor old Joseph here, is that you know, you, you make your plans as a human being and then you're not sure, are they right or are they wrong? Um, there were times in, in, in that particular period in my life when I was wrestling with the call where I would love Gabriel just to have come and, and, and chatted to me, you know, or writing on the wall or those kind of things. But I didn't have, didn't have that. Uh, thankfully, I had the scriptures and I had some, some wonderful godly people in my life to, to guide me. But Joseph comes up in his mind with this plan and we see in verse 20 that God intervenes. Let me read it again. But after he had considered this, so this is Joseph now considering the divorce. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And then verse 21 says, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So, so what I'm reflecting here is that Joseph is tempted to make his own plans and ultimately change God's great plan. But God, in his wisdom, is able to bring Joseph back in line with the plan. And that brings me to Psalm 33, verse 10 and 11, which says this, The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. And we see that, uh, not so much with the nations in this example, but we see this with Joseph in, uh, in Joseph's quest to, to make a decision, um, to do what is right. He moves away from God's plan, but God brings him back to God's great plan. Proverbs 21, sorry, Proverbs 19, verse 20 and 21 also reminds us of this. It says, get all the advice and the instruction you can so you'll be wise for the rest of your life. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. And this, as I, as, I, as I mentioned to you, was brought home to me in my own life, in my own testimony, and I'm sure maybe some of you can testify that, uh, to that example also. But here we see Joseph being brought back in line with God's great plans tempted to go on his own mission, go down his own path, but God brings him back. And so having said that, let's move on a little bit further into our passage as we reflect on, on the plans that God has for us. The great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, used to have very definite convictions about how God's ministry or work should be done. And he um, felt there were a few options, especially when it came to plans and, and God's plans. He felt that we could either start off by making the best plans possible and then trying to carry them out in our own strength, and that obviously wasn't the best scenario. He, he felt that we could then secondly make careful plans and then ask God to bless them, which was a bit better than the first option. But he felt that the, the, the greatest option would be would be to go to God in the beginning and ask God for God's plans. And then when we had those plans revealed, then we'd offer ourselves to God to help carry out those plans. Um, and, and obviously we understand that that would be the best case scenario, but sometimes we aren't given such clear direction like Joseph was given. Um, we have to come in faith and through prayer and scriptures and then make a decision based on faith and step out and trust that God will lead us. But many, many years ago, there was a young lady who was wrestling with finding a partner in, uh, in her life. She was a teenager and she wrote this prayer to God, seeking God's direction and basically God's plan for her life. And she wrote this prayer and I'm gonna read it for us. She says this, dear God, I pray all unafraid, as girls are wont to be. I do not want a handsome man, but Lord, make him like thee. I do not need one big and strong, nor yet so very tall, nor need he be some genius or wealthy Lord at all. But let his head be high, dear God, and let his eye be clear, his shoulders straight, whatever his fate, whatever his earthly sphere. And let his face have character, a ruggedness of soul, 
and let his whole life show, dear God, a singleness of goal. And when he comes, as he will come, with quiet eyes aglow, I know, dear Lord, that he's the man I prayed for long ago. What a beautiful prayer, a prayer of surrender, a prayer specifically asking for, for a person, a husband, but in a way also a prayer of relinquishing this to, uh, to God's grand design. Now what is remarkable is that the young lady who wrote that prayer was Ruth Bell. Ruth Bell met a young man years later by the name of Billy Graham. And Ruth and Billy were married and lived happily for many, many years as a married couple, well into their 90s. And so I just share that story just to, to remind us again that, that it's all right to have plans, but we must include God in those plans. We must say, Lord, may your will be done in, in these plans. Um, and we're going to see this now as we move on to the final part of this reflection today, that ultimately when we entrust our lives into God's hands, we trust that he will bring about the best for us, the best plans, the best outcome in, uh, in, in every aspect of our lives. That's the step of faith that we have to take. Let's go on now to look at verse 24. Verse 24 of Matthew 1 says that when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. And that's very profound for us because what it shows us is that Joseph had the faith and the courage to, to follow through in obedience to what God had said to him through the angel. Um, and, and we sometimes think, well, we probably also would have done the same thing. Um, if the angel had appeared to us. But we must give Joseph credit for the, the willingness, the humility to change his own thinking and his own plans to then step forward in faith and to follow the plans that God had given to him. It's also helpful for us to, to think about what, what else may have given him the motivation or the courage to do that. And maybe it was the words that the angel had said earlier on um, in the same interchange where he had said, the angel had said to Joseph, do not be afraid. And that's a beautiful phrase, do not fear, do not be afraid. The angel is saying to Joseph, listen, I know the plan seems strange for you, but God is in this. Just hold on to the fact that God is in this. Maybe also as a, um, as a Jewish man and somebody who knew his scriptures, Joseph may have held on to other passages that he would have known probably by heart. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 says, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Perhaps that was a scripture that he held on to. Equally so, maybe Isaiah 48, verse 8. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purposes for you long ago? And maybe even one more, the one that we know very well. Perhaps Joseph was thinking about all these things and he remembered the passage that Jeremiah said to the people. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Perhaps all of that combined together with the presence of the angel gave Joseph that courage that he needed to say, Lord, okay, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm willing to follow your plan. Let's come then now to the final part of our message for today. The author Sam Portara says this, that we have no idea what the future holds for us. And we forget that neither Mary or Joseph could have anticipated the fullness of their child's life, much less its enduring power in our own lives and he touches on something interesting there because none of us knows what tomorrow brings none of us knows even that the best laid plans how they're going to to work out and as we reflect on this today and the second sunday in advent i've been having a look at the nativity scene with um, with perhaps some new insight i know that we're all familiar with nativity scenes like this you may have one in your own home or in your church we have Jesus lying in the manger and the wise men and the shepherds, the angel and Mary and Joseph 
And I've been thinking about our friend Joseph and wondering, you know, what was going through his mind as um, he's standing there or sitting there looking at, at the Christ child. And I wonder, because sometimes we, we just assume that Mary and Joseph are standing around not thinking anything, but um, I wonder if he was thinking to himself, sure, if I hadn't listened to God's plans, I may not be standing in this moment enjoying the beautiful gift that lies before me. Um, and, and maybe there was a sense of relief in, in Joseph's heart and his mind that he had had the courage to listen to the angel and listen to God. And so friends, today as, as you contemplate the gospel in perhaps a different way, maybe some of you are, are thinking about decisions or plans that you, that you want to make or you feel like you have to make. I just want to encourage you to, to include God in those plans. Uh, God really does want the best for us. And sometimes his plans seem very different from our plans. Um, and he gets us, gets us there sometimes through very divergent ways. But I pray that you would include God and ask his spirit to lead you and guide you. And may you continue to be blessed by the miracle at the manger as we journey closer and closer towards Christmas Day. I'm going to share a prayer with us as we close. It's by a lady called Krista Hutchins, um, and I offer it to us as we finish this time of worship together. Join me as we pray. Lord, thank you for another week to serve you and to be your hands and feet. I've made my plans for this week, and now I lay them at your feet, because you know best. If these are the things that you want me to do, I pray that you'll give me the energy, the focus, and the discipline to get them done and I trust you for the outcomes. Lord, if you have other plans for me, then change them, rearrange them, completely turn them around. I put my confidence in you. Your will be done, not mine. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, friends. Have a wonderful week, and hopefully we'll see you next Sunday.